Okay. Uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, my dear friend Nancy Fraser, whose considerable contributions to the fields of critical theory, political philosophy, and feminist thought have not only impacted those fields in important ways and become essential readings for students in those fields, but have even been cited, I found this out, in major decisions by the Brazilian Supreme Court. <laughs> Two major decisions, actually. The international reach of her influence is expressed succinctly by her positions. Nancy Fraser is currently the Loeb Professor of Philosophy and Politics at the New School for Social Research in New York, she holds the Global Justice Chair at the Collège d'Études Mondiales in Paris, is professor at the Center for Gender Research at Oslo, and an Einstein Fellow at the Freie Universität in Berlin. Covering a span of over 30 years, Professor Fraser's writings on social justice, gender and race, recognition and redistribution, as well as on social domination and emancipation, have been published, republished, and translated into at least a dozen languages. Her latest book, and incidentally we have a book table out in the back, her latest book containing many of her now classic articles was published last year by Verso and is uh, entitled Fortunes of Feminism from State-Managed Capitalism to Neoliberal Crisis. We look forward to hearing and discussing her, later, her latest elaboration of critical theory and our contemporary world in tonight's talk, Legitimation Crisis on the Political Contradictions of, fin of Financialized Capitalism. One further announcement. In addition to tonight's lecture, there will be a discussion with Professor Fraser tomorrow at 4.30 p.m., at 5733 South University Avenue. It will be about her article, which you can download, uh, Beyond Marx's Hidden Abode for an Expanded Conception of Capitalism, which appeared earlier this year in New Left Review. Please join me and the co-sponsors of today's talk, the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, and the Social Theory Workshop in welcoming Professor Nancy Fraser. Thank you so much, Moish, for that very generous introduction. And uh, thanks to all those various centers and workshops for uh, sponsoring this event. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I do want to talk about um, how critical theory might develop in a way that could clarify our uh, very contemporary uh, situation. And um, as you'll see, the, this talk builds um, very directly on the paper that Moish mentioned that will be discussed at uh, tomorrow's workshop. So let me just situate it by telling you that my, my current work involves trying to reconstruct the critical theory of capitalist crisis in a form that is intellectually respectable meaning that avoids economism, teleology, determinism, class essentialism, and a host of other sins that have caused this form of critique and critical theory uh, to fall into considerable disfavor. I understand capitalist crisis as a multidimensional process that encompasses not only financial and economic crisis, but also ecological, crisis, social reproduction crisis, and political crisis. Now this last political dimension of crisis is my focus um, here today, and I'm going to follow Marx, Habermas, and many others in conceiving crisis as a process that unfolds on two levels, 
first of all a structural level uh, in which one would want to focus on um, uh, where am I? Yes, on the institutional dynamics that generate a kind of systemic instability in society of a given type. And secondly, on a social action or agency level, where one wants to focus on the social conflicts that arise as a result of the lived experience of these system dynamics and instabilities. Now, how exactly a critical theory might relate those two levels, this structural level and this action level, is um, a difficult question and one that I am also uh, going to try to broach at least uh, to some degree um, today. Now, I take it that the potential interest of a critical theory of capitalist crisis today is sufficiently clear to overcome the, the sort of knee-jerk hostility that has surrounded this idea until fairly recently and to at least win me a, um, a hearing here. I also take it that the importance of theorizing the specifically political dimension of the current crisis is clear. And I ask you simply to uh, contemplate the the really remarkable proliferation of various accounts that denounce the crisis of democracy, as it's called. I think of Colin Crouch's account of post-democracy, Wendy Brown's account of de-democratization, Wolfgang Streich's account of the end of democratic capitalism, even uh, Jürgen Habermas, that paradigmatic European, characterizes the European Union as a form of post-democratic executive Federalism. One could also cite innumerable references to what is called facade democracy. Now, these formulations, and there are many more, reference a number of very obvious and incontrovertible phenomena. Steep declines in electoral turnouts, the dramatic rise of right-wing extremism, widespread disaffection with the European Union, the declining credibility of the United States as a legitimate and rational and dependable world hegemon, the virtual collapse of left-wing parties, at least in the global north, the sharp narrowing of the spectrum of policy differences as nearly all political parties rush to placate the bond markets, as if to say we are all neoliberals now a widespread sense that public power is being hollowed out at every level, that it has been captured by private interests, that it is non-responsive to those in whose name it is exercised, that it is in any case badly outgunned by private powers, especially by finance capital and by oligopolistic corporations with a global reach. Now, I have to note um, right at the outset, and I'll say a little more about this later, that these perceptions pertain above all to the global north. The view from Latin America and from China is rather different, as we shall see. Nevertheless, the sense that democracy may be ending in capitalism's historical heartland has some genuine diagnostic interest and social import. In my view, however, the current ills of democracy should be understood in a rather specific way. As signaled by the subtitle of my lecture, they are, in my view, more or less acute expressions of what I am calling the political contradictions of financialized capitalism. What does it mean to interpret what others call the crisis of democracy in this way? It means, first of all, that so-called de-democratization is an aspect of something broader and deeper, namely a current general crisis, a crisis of financialized capitalism as such. And it means that such de-democratization is not a merely accidental or contingent development, but one with some deep systemic roots in the structure of capitalist society or rather in that form of capitalist society, financialized, globalizing, neoliberal capitalism, which we experience now. That, in any case, is the thesis I want to explore here. And my idea, in a nutshell, is 
is this. Every capitalist social formation harbors a deep-seated political crisis tendency or contradiction, to use a familiar Marxian terminology. On the one hand, legitimate efficacious public power is an indispensable condition of possibility for sustained capital accumulation. On the other hand, capitalism's intrinsic drive to endless accumulation tends to destabilize the very public power on which it also relies. This so-called political contradiction of capitalism lies at the root, I claim, of the present political crisis and of the massive hollowing out of public power that I have just noted. Although inherent in capitalism as such, this contradiction assumes a different and distinctive guise in every historically specific form of capitalist society. For example, it takes one form in liberal competitive capitalism, another in state-managed monopoly capitalism, and yet another in our own time in financialized neoliberal capitalism. So in what follows, I want to explore this hypothesis in three steps. First, I'm going to propose an account of what I've just uh, called the political contradiction of capitalism as such, without reference to any specific historical form. Second, I'm going to try to reconstruct the argument of Jürgen Habermas's 1973 book, Legitimation Crisis, as an account of the unfolding of this political contradiction in one historical phase of capitalist development, namely state-managed monopoly capitalism. And finally, I want to try to sketch at least the beginnings of an account of today's crisis of democracy as uh, the expression of capitalism's inherent political contradiction in its current financialized neoliberal phase. So first step, the political contradiction of capitalism as such. The standard view of capitalist crisis centers on contradictions internal to its economy. One influential version posits an inherent tendency in the rate of profit to decline, a tendency that can be expressed in crises of overaccumulation or of overproduction or of underconsumption and so on. The details of those accounts need not concern us here. What is important is the core idea that the capitalist accumulation process institutionalizes mutually incompatible imperatives which render its dynamic inherently, if tendentially, unstable for non-accidental reasons. At the heart of capitalism qua economic system, then, is a profound tendency to self-destabilization. Now, this view uh, may well be right as far as it goes. In fact, I suspect it is. But it fails to provide a full picture of capitalism's inherent contradictions or crisis tendencies. The reason is that the view in question is economistic. It understands capitalism too narrowly as an economic system simpliciter. On my view, capitalism is better understood more broadly as an institutionalized social order on a par, for example, with feudalism. Its economic subsystem, as Habermas would say, is a very important constituent element of this social order, but it is not freestanding and it cannot be adequately understood in abstraction from other constituent ele elements which form its background conditions of possibility. Now elsewhere, in fact, in this paper that is going to be discussed tomorrow, I've identified three principal background conditions for the possibility of capitalism's economic subsystem and indeed for the official economic accumulation process located within it. One of these, capital accumulation's political conditions of possibility, is my principal focus here but I do want to briefly mention the other two. The first of these, social reproduction, 
has been extensively theorized by feminist thinkers, especially social, socialist feminist thinkers, variously identified with terms such as care, affective labor, or in another paradigm, subjectivation, social reproduction consists in activities often unwaged and often performed by women, although not exclusively, that create and maintain social bonds while also forming capitalism's human subjects who are, among other things, the bearer of that, bearers of that peculiar commodity labor power. Social reproduction in this sense is an indispensable background condition for economic production. A second necessary background condition for a capitalist economy has to do with nature and has been extensively elaborated recently by eco-socialist thinkers. Nature is understood here as an indispensable source of material and ener energetic or energetic, I don't know if that's a word, energetic inputs for commodity production and as a sink for absorbing the latter's waste. Like social reproduction, it is also an indispensable precondition for capitalist production, absent reliable social reproductive and natural supplies or inputs, there could be no commodity production and exchange, no exploitation of labor, no accumulation of capital, no capitalist economic subsystem. Now, the same is true for my third background condition for the possibility of a capitalist economy, namely legitimate efficacious political power or public power. Since this condition is the focus of the present lecture, I want to now elaborate it in a bit more detail. What is at stake here are the political conditions for the possibility of economic production and capital accumulation. Capital's reliance on public powers to establish and enforce its constitutive norms capital accumulation is inconceivable, after all, in the absence of a legal framework underpinning private enterprise and market exchange. Its front story, as I've called it, depends crucially on public powers to guarantee property rights, enforce contracts, adjudicate disputes, quell anti-capitalist rebellions, and maintain, in the language of the U.S. Constitution, the full faith and credit of the money supply that constitutes capital's lifeblood. Historically, the public powers in question have mostly been lodged in territorial states, including those that operated also as colonial powers. It was the legal systems of such states that established the contours of seemingly depoliticized arenas within which private actors could pursue their economic interests free from overt political interference on the one hand and from patronage obligations derived from kinship on the other. Likewise, it was territorial states that mobilized the so-called legitimate force to put down resistance to the expropriations through which capitalist property relations were originated and sustained. Finally, it was such states that nationalized and underwrote money. Historically, then, we might say the state constituted the capitalist economy. And here we are dealing, therefore, with a major structural division that is absolutely constitutive for capitalist society in this enlarged sense. That is, the division between polity and economy. With this division comes the institutional differentiation of public from private power, of political from economic coercion. This division arose as, the, as a result of the breakup of a previous world. What was dismantled was a world in which economic and political power were effectively fused, as for example in feudal society, where control over labor, land, and military force was vested in the single institution of lordship and vassalage. In capitalist society, by contrast, economic power and political power are split apart. Each is assigned its own sphere, its own medium, 
and modus operandi. But that is not all. Capitalism's economic front story also has background political conditions of possibility at the geopolitical level. What is at issue here is the organization of the broader space in which territorial states are embedded. This is a space in which capital moves quite easily and naturally given its expansionist thrust. But its ability to operate across borders depends on international law, brokered arrangements among the great powers, and supranational regimes which partially pacify, in a capital-friendly way to be sure, a realm that is often imagined as a state of nature. Throughout its history, capitalism's front story has depended on the military and organizational capacities of a succession of global hegemons, which, as Giovanni Arrighi argued, have sought to foster accumulation on a progressively expanding scale within the framework of a multi-state system. And I, I can't resist the temptation to add that it was in the very social theory group that um, Boish mentioned, where I first read and passionately dis debated with him the views of Arrighi. Here, in any case, we find uh, some further structural divisions which are constitutive of capitalist society in this enlarged sense that I'm proposing. First of all, the so-called Westphalian division between the domestic and the international, um, and the imperialist division between core, core and periphery, both of which, I think, are premised on the more fundamental division between an increasingly global capitalist economy organized as a world system and a political world organized still as an international system of territorial states. Four further points are needed to round out this picture. First, to understand capitalism as an institutionalized order is to take, as I've been saying, an enlarged view of it which foregrounds its constitutive institutional divisions and separations, the divisions between economy and polity, domestic and international, core and periphery, which I've just stressed, but also between economy and society, reproduction and production, human and non-human nature. I don't have time here to elaborate those, but they pertain to those other background conditions that I mentioned before. Second point, Although they are constitutive of capitalism as an institutionalized social order, these divisions are not simply given once and for all, but are rather subject to historical variation and contestation. Precisely where and how capitalist societies draw the line between economy and polity, as well as between production and reproduction, human and non-human nature, varies according to the regime of accumulation. In fact, we can conceptualize competitive laissez-faire capitalism, state-managed monopoly capitalism, and globalizing neoliberal capitalism in precisely these terms, as three historically specific ways of demarcating economy from polity, production from reproduction, human from non-human nature. Third point, the, the precise configuration of the capitalist order at any place and time depends on politics, on the balance of social power, and on the outcome of previous social struggles. Far from being simply given, capitalism's institutional divisions often become foci of conflict as actors mobilize to challenge or defend the established boundaries separating economy from polity, production from reproduction, human from non-human nature. Certainly, this boundary between economy and polity is contested today, as indeed are those between production and reproduction, human and non-human nature. These boundaries, I think, are the very stuff of social struggle in capitalist societies, as fundamental as the class struggles over control of commodity production and distribution of surplus value that are usually privileged in accounts of capitalism. These boundary struggles, as I have called them, decisively shape the structure of capitalist societies. They play a constitutive role 
in the view of capitalism that I've been elaborating as an institutionalized social order. Now the fourth and final point returns us to the problem of crisis. The expanded view of capitalism as not merely an economy, but as an institutionalized social order, entails as well an expanded view of capitalism's crisis tendencies. Over and above the economic contradictions that Marx and others have theorized, we now find additional inherent proclivities to self-destabilization, political, ecological, and social. These additional crisis tendencies are grounded not in contradictions internal to the economy, but rather in contradictions between the economic system and its background conditions of possibility, hence between economy and polity, economy and society, economy and nature. All of these contradictions share, as it were, a common grammar. On the one hand, capitalist e economic production is not self-sustaining, but free rides on social reproduction, on nature, and on public power. Yet, its orientation to endless accumulation threatens to destabilize those very conditions of its possibility. In the case of its ecological conditions, what is at risk are the natural processes that sustain life and provide the material inputs for social provisioning. In the case of its social reproduction conditions, what is imperiled are the socio-cultural processes that supply the solidary relations, the affective dispositions, and the value horizons that underpin social cooperation, while also furnishing the appropriately socialized and skilled human beings who constitute labor. In the case of its political conditions, what is compromised are the public powers, both national and transnational, that guarantee property rights, enforce contracts, adjudicate disputes, quell anti-capitalist rebellions, and maintain the money supply. Now, it's that last contradiction that is central uh, to my purposes here, and the conclusion that I'm drawing from this first step of the argument is that capitalist societies harbor inherent tendencies to political crisis. Okay, so far I've been elaborating the structure of this political crisis tendency for capitalism as such. <coughs> However, capitalism as such does not exist. Uh, capitalism exists only in historically specific forms or regimes of accumulation, which consist, as I noted just before, in historically specific and distinctive configurations of the institutional divisions I've just identified. So the next step in my argument is to historicize my expanded view of capitalist crisis tendencies, especially the inherent tendency to political crisis in relation to specific regimes. Now, I'm not going to discuss the forms of political crisis specific to competitive liberal laissez-faire capitalism, but I do want to mention two principal points of reference for such a discussion. I suppose they're not the only two by any means. One that strikes me as especially pertinent is Hannah Arendt's a chapter on imperialism in The Origins of Totalitarianism, which identifies some specifically sp political stress points that arise in both core and periphery as a result of the economically driven colonial expansion of nominally democratic territorial states, their, their acquisition of colonies. Another uh, important reference point for me would be Karl Polanyi's account in The Great Transformation of the range of morbid, that's actually Gramsci's word, morbid political forms that uh, societies adopt in hopes of protecting themselves from the ravages of uncontrolled free market liberalism. Now, although I would like to develop this aspect at some point, and I, I definitely intend to do so, I'm going to turn now instead to the forms of political crisis specific to the World War II era, the so-called Trente Glorieuse, as the French call it, or as I will call it, the era of state-managed capitalism. 
And here, my principal point of reference, at least for now, this is probably not the last word on it, but this is where I am now in this project. My principal point of reference is, as I said, Habermas's 1973 book, Legitimation Crisis, probably the, the least uh, discussed of his works uh, today. Um, and unfortunately, because I think, as I hope to show, despite its um, clearly dated aspects, there are some very important um, moves in it that could serve us uh, today. Now, as I'm reading it, Legitimation Crisis gives an account of the changed role of the state in this new post-liberal regime of accumulation. Whereas the state in the liberal regime was chiefly concerned to constitute the private market economy and to repress revolts against it, as I just mentioned in the previous section, it undertakes here the additional functions of economic crisis management endeavoring, for example, to stabilize demand and to soften boom-bust cycles through such measures as counter-cyclical spending, the creation of a public sector of the economy, which partially replaces the market, managing labor-capital relations through corporatist negotiations, and the like, all of these so-called Keynesian social democratic uh, crisis management tools. In the terms I was using um, just uh, a minute ago, the state moves out of the background and into the foreground of capitalist society, which it now shares with the capitalist economy. For Habermas, writing in Capitalism's Golden Age, as Eric Hobsbawm called it, the result was to tame the economic contradictions of capitalism. But the effect was not, and here comes the radical claim of the book, to overcome capitalism's proclivity to crisis altogether. It was, on the contrary, to displace the crisis tendencies, to relocate crisis from the economy to the state, from the economic to the political field. And so legitimation crisis is fundamentally an account of the political contradictions of state-managed capitalism viewed from the perspective of the bounded territorial state. As a result, it must be uh, said, it has little systematic to say about the ecological or social reproductive dimensions of crisis on the one hand, or about the geopolitical dimensions on the other hand, although it must be said that all of those facets are duly mentioned and sometimes in ways that are quite suggestive. The fundamental contradiction, though, that the book identifies is this. Insofar as it assumes the task of economic crisis management, the state accepts responsibility for assuring economic growth, for achieving a relatively legitimate distribution and adequate levels of employment, for wage price stability, for social welfare provision, for all sorts of matters previously viewed as best left to the market. In assuming these functions, therefore, the state opens itself to the possibility of administrative failure and of being held accountable for that. Equally important, the state now requires considerably increased stores of legitimation, support from the democratic citizenry. So increased state responsibility requires higher levels of legitimation, and yet all of this transpires while the fundamental class character of the society remains unaltered. And so, we're talking about forms of crisis management that might not be able to withstand, in Habermas's view, a robust democratic vetting by an active citizenry. What is required, in other words, is a peculiar hollowed out form of legitimation a certain formulaic acceptance from a pacified and pacifized citizenry. The question then about crisis as Habermas poses it is, can the state get adequate political support for vastly expanded administrative functions, all of which are aimed ultimately at preserving class domination without provoking a true legitimation crisis without, that is, activating the citizenry and causing it to question the class character of society and the private appropriation of social surplus.
for Habermas, the answer depends on the extant forms of political culture and social psychology. While inscribed as an inherent tendency in this form of capitalism, a true legitimation crisis is by no means guaranteed. Such a crisis occurs rather only given some other factors, which Habermas summarizes under the heading of a motivation crisis. The key question for him is whether a critical mass of citizens will be motivated to reject the privatized, consumerist, and careerist orientations that form the existential underpin underpinnings of the hollowed out legitimation the system requires. Are enough citizens disposed to reject those orientations in favor of participatory public engagement aimed at deep social structural transformation? Are they inclined to demand legitimation of class domination and failing to get it to insist that it be overcome? For Habermas, this in turn depends on the strength of their socialization to normative justification of the institutional orders to which they are subject. So long as a critical mass of citizen retains this orientation, this penchant for insisting that relations of domination to which they are subject be justified or abolished, a true legitimation crisis is possible. If and when that orientation is sapped or disabled altogether, and the patent a possibility of an administrative crisis of state-managed capitalism would not translate into a legitimation crisis. Now, for a time in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the propitious conditions that Habermas specified might well have appeared to be met. State-managed capitalism might, it appeared, still be shaken to its very core, even in the absence of a visible economic crisis, by a new form of political crisis. And this crisis might lead, even in the absence of militant class struggle, to major social transformation. Today, of course, the very idea must seem rather quaint. It is worth asking, nevertheless, what is living and what is dead in the framework proposed in legitimation crisis? What, if anything, can be salvaged from it for a critical theory of the political con uh, contradictions of 21st century capitalism? I want to begin with the negative. There are at least two obvious features of the legitimation crisis model that are badly dated and would have to be uh, thoroughly jettisoned in any uh, effort to uh, uh, reconstruct the framework. One is the so-called displacement thesis, according to which tamed economic crisis tendencies are displaced or relocated to the political sphere. Whatever its merits for the 1970s, this thesis is patently inapplicable today. The grammar of our crisis today is not at all displacement. Rather, the crisis mutates and shifts location, careering from subprime, subprime finance to Wall Street as such, to Main Street, to social reproduction and ecology, to sovereign debt crisis, to state crisis, to EU crisis, and on and on. But no single aspect is tamed in the course of this shifting and, and mutation. Far from signifying displacement, these shifts suggest um, to me uh, the metaphor of metastasization, that is the rampant, rap rapid proliferation of crisis forms and crisis sites. Second, the Westphalian framing presumed in legitimation crisis is no longer apt if indeed it ever was. Whatever its merits for state-managed capitalism, which of course by definition um, definitely relies on a certain Westphalian framing, um, whatever its merits for that period, it has ceased um, in any respect to reflect the realities of 21st century capitalism, globalized, disorganized as it's been called, and financialized. Any attempt to clarify the political contradictions of this form of capitalism 
must accord much more attention than Habermas gave to the global, transnational, and geopolitical levels of public power, without, of course, neglecting the state. In particular, it must pay much more attention to the problem of scale. Just as we should substitute metastasization for displacement, so we might uh, substitute, or, or rather replace, the Westphalian frame of legitimation crisis with a complex multi-scalar frame, neither simply national nor simply post-national or global, but an interscalar perspective within which processes unfolding simultaneously at different scales intersect and indeed collide. That's the sort of negative uh, side. But what about the positive side? I want to suggest that there are uh, several good reasons for revisiting legitimation crisis as we look for concepts and styles of analysis that can help us understand the political contradictions of financialized capitalism today. Consider that we do uh, indeed need, as I said at the outset, a crisis critique today and indeed a non-economistic form of crisis critique. This critique, uh, critique should take as its object not democratic crisis as such, in my view, but rather democratic crisis as a strand of capitalist crisis in its fir current form of financialized capitalism. Habermas had the very good intuition that capitalist crisis could not be simply equated with economic crisis, that in the post-war era, the unfolding of economic crisis tendencies, or perhaps their taming, would be inextricably bound up with that of political crisis tendencies. This, I think, remains emphatically the case today, albeit in a different form. Habermas also had a good intuition that capitalist crisis had to be addressed simultaneously at two levels. This recurs to a point I mentioned at the very beginning. On the structural level, critique had to identify the historically specific dynamics in which inherent self-destabilizing tendencies played out. On the action level, meanwhile, it had to attend to the responses of social actors to the forms of social struggle or of social passivity through which they lived the crisis, hence to the prospects for a transformative emancipatory resolution. This too remains emphatically true today in my view, albeit again in a somewhat different form. More specifically, Habermas had a good insight that a system crisis, whether economic or political or both, would not automatically or unfailingly become a practical force provoking transformative struggle. He understood that that depended on the presence of some complex psychosocial motivations and political cultural orientations, as well as on assumptions about the availability or not of feasible, desirable alternatives to the present order. This too is the case today, in my view, um, however much the specifics uh, vary from those he adduced. So for all of these reasons, I'm going to try to see um, how far I can get by treating legitimation crisis as a major benchmark and foil as I turn now to step three of my argument. So the political contradictions of financialized capitalism. To understand the forms of political crisis today, then, I'm going to start from the general political contradiction of capitalism I identified, namely capital's simultaneously reliance on and tendency to destabilize forms of public power that co-constitute its economy. I propose also to concretize and historicize that contradiction by reference to Habermas's categorical distinctions between administrative crisis, legitimation crisis, and motivation crisis. Based on these suppositions, let me now sketch an account that it tries to be at once 
a bit narrative and a bit analytical, a bit empirical and a bit critical of some salient political features of the current crisis of financialized capitalism. And as you'll see, I'm drawing on the very rich uh, body of work uh, that many observers of this so-called crisis of democracy, who I mentioned earlier, have uh, provided. So I'm going to begin with what Habermas would call the administrative crisis of contemporary democracy, the fact that increasingly our instituted public powers lack the capacity and the will to stand up to private powers, and so as a result are unwilling or unable to even try in a serious way to solve such pressing problems as global warming or financial regulation in the public interest. Consider then the following. First, at the geopolitical level, the dismantling of the Bretton Woods regime of capital controls unleashed unregulated flows of financial speculation and deprived territorial state governments of control over their money supplies. As a result, those governments faced major difficulties whenever they tried to manage economic crisis tendencies by the, that Keynesian toolbox and, above all, by introducing counter-cyclical deficit spending. At the state level, governments prevented from resorting to public Keynesianism turned first to what Colin Crouch has called privatized Keynesianism. They encouraged consumer debt, home mortgages, credit card spendings, and increasingly now student loans, in order to continue high levels of consumer spending under changed conditions of declining real wages, rising unemployment, and precarity. Not to mention a militant, coordinated tax revolt by corporations and the wealthy, as has been amply demonstrated by Wolfgang Streich. This policy of debt-fueled consumerism promoted exactly the sort of orientation that Habermas called civic privatism. By encouraging citizens to focus their aspirations on privatized life and on commodified satisfaction, it managed to buy for governments a form of political legitimation that was conveniently passive in the face of upwardly redistributive policies that might otherwise have elicited active protest. When the 2008 financial crisis put an end to that scenario, the powers that be, as we know, chose to sacrifice the interests of ordinary citizens and taxpayers to those of private investors. Bailing out the latter at the expense of the former, they tumbled straight into sovereign debt crises. Deprived of administrative capacity, not to mention democratic sovereignty, indebted states were then forced by the blackmail of the so-called markets to institute what is called austerity. The European Union, once considered the very avatar of post-national democracy, rushed to do the bidding of the bankers, ignoring massive citizen protests and forfeiting its claim to democratic legitimacy. At the transnational level, meanwhile, financialized capitalism has brought us the era of governance without government, i.e. the proliferation of private and quasi-public regulatory agencies, which make coercively enforceable rules that govern vast swaths of social interaction throughout the world. Familiar examples include NAFTA and TRIPS, which is the International Neoliberal Regime of Intellectual Property Rights. Utterly undemocratic, these governance structures often operate in secret or relative secret and are in any case accountable to no one, except of course to their corporate masters. Operating overwhelmingly in the interest of capital, it is far from clear that they could survive a genuine robust vetting in the public sphere. Increasingly too, such neoliberal policies are locked in, made invulnerable to future change by what Stephen Gill has called the new constitutionalism. For example, various international courts and dispute resolution bodies lock in so-called free trade strictures, which are held to, drum, to trump any conceivable state policies, past, present, and future, that would regulate labor relations and the environment in the interests of democratic publics. 
as neoliberal macro policy is effectively being constitutionalized or hardwired in these regimes, the democratic agenda is narrowed, preempted in advance. At every level, moreover, we see the capture of public power by private, that means corporate power. Some examples include overt and covert lobbying, the revolving door between government and private firms, which ensures that representatives of private interests are increasingly writing the very regulations to which they are subject, the increased contracting out of public uh, services to private firms, uh, most notoriously prison management and many military functions here in the United States, which is the sort of uh, advanced wedge of that um, aspect. The rise of PPP, so-called public-private partnerships, which are oriented to serving consumers as opposed to citizens, and uh, which change the qualitative meaning and character of public services. In effect, uh, what I'm trying to suggest here, public power is being internally colonized as its modus operandi is increasingly modeled on that of private firms. Government agencies are now organized on the basis of internal profit loss centers, which compete for zero-based budget allocations. The Foucault-inspired literature on neoliberal governmentality has described many of the aspects of this quite well. Now, I could cite many other examples, but I want to stop here. I could get easily carried away. Uh, I, I think it's enough, uh, I hope, to uh, motivate the general point that uh, democracy is indeed being hollowed out at every level. Political agendas are everywhere narrowed, both by external fiat, the demands, the blackmail of the markets, and by internal mutation or corporate capture. Matters once, once considered to be squarely within the purview of democratic political action, think back to the Habermasian expansion of the state uh, uh, capacity, um, are now declared off limits and devolved to the markets, which is to say, this talk of the markets, of course, is very misleading. These are not real markets. What that real, that's code for oligopolistic corporate capital. The response to those who question these arrangements is, Tina, there is no alternative. This is just the way the economy and therefore the world must work, or so we are told. Now, the overall result at one level is a major administrative crisis. With respect to so-called output legitimacy, public powers cannot or perhaps will not deliver solutions to those in whose name they govern. But what about the so-called input side? Is there a legitimation crisis today? Certainly, our political institutions face major legitimation deficits at every scale. But legitimation deficit is not the same as legitimation crisis in Habermas's sense. In fact, the global north sees very little in the way of coordinated militant campaigns that would subject the current structures of financialized capitalism to sustained critique and transformation. And that's what he meant by a legitimation crisis. What we see instead, as I noted before, is a rise in right-wing extremism, increased demoralization, electoral abstention, and a generalized retreat from institutionalized political activity into private life or into neo-anarchist forms of what Marcuse would have called the great refusal. The most promising movements, such as Occupy Wall Street and its European counterparts, which won widespread support in the early days of the current crisis, proved to be quite ephemeral, dissipating as quickly as they erupted and leaving behind little in the way of programmatic thinking or organizational structure. Spain's Podemos represents an important exception, but far more typical and symptomatic is France's Le Zadisme, which is an acronym for Les Zones à Défendre. This iconic oppositional movement is entirely defensive, aimed merely at shielding delimited zones from corporate predation while relinquishing the more ambitious goal of transforming the larger order that enables such predation in the first place. The absence of a real legitimation crisis in the global north uh, 
becomes palpably evident when one considers the contrast case of Latin America. There, one sees a major counter-hegemonic bloc committed to developing an alternative to the present uh, social order of neoliberal financialized capitalism. This movement finds expression, I must say, in the Brazilian Supreme Court, which has the good taste to <laughs> appoint law clerks who have studied at the New School and therefore know my work. There's a sort of network story about how these <laughs> citations emerge. Um, uh, anyway, it finds expression in the so-called pink tide of left and center-left governments that have been elected and re-elected on campaigns to resist neoliberalization and to build or rebuild, in some cases, developmental states. Its iconic figure today, I would say, is no longer uh, Hugo Chavez, but Argentine President Cristina Fernandez Kirchner, who has openly defied the blackmail of the bondholder holdouts and of the U.S. courts that elevated the, latter, the latter's claims over those of Argentine citizens. Another important development, in, uh, again in Latin America, is the activation and mobilization the political incorporation of masses of poor indigenous peoples previously excluded altogether from political life. Along with this expansion of the public goes a major expansion of the political agenda, the continued proliferation and mutual coordination of progressive movements in civil society, the existence of healthy, relatively open channels of communication and interaction between state and society, and a palpable sense of regional solidarity. In Latin America, unlike in Europe, there really does exist something approaching a transnational public sphere. Now, it would be very foolish to idealize this pink tide, which of course remains ambivalent, unfinished, fragile, tainted in places with populism, caudillismo, and clientelism, and which is highly vulnerable to shifts in world commodity prices and in levels especially of Chinese demand. With if, when that goes, the whole <laughs> capacity to fund all the stuff they want to do will go as well. Nevertheless, it is worth noting that nothing remotely resembling this sort of productive legitimation crisis appears in the United States, where neoliberal thinking remains hegemonic and where many who suffer from it have been persuaded, at least for now, that their hopes for a better life are best fulfilled through devolving responsibility to the markets and to business. Nor do we see any counter hegemony of comparable breadth in Europe, where the palpable dislike of neoliberalism divides between authoritarian populism and anti-Europeanism on the one hand, and demoralized passivity and anti-programmatic neo-anarchism on the other. It is natural for us to ask why do matters stand like this today and what is to be done? Some clarification, maybe not enough, but some may be won by mobilizing aspects of the framework of legitimation crisis. Recall that for an administrative crisis to translate into a true legitimation crisis, certain enabling conditions must be in place. Characterized by Habermas under the phrase motivation crisis, these conditions have to do with political psychology and political culture, with the ways in which people understand their place in history and their capacities for collective action. Let me mention five such presuppositions for the, source, for the sort of legitimation crisis that I think is the sine qua non for pointing us beyond the current impasse. First, a genuine legitimation crisis presupposes subjects who conceive themselves as potential members of a shared community of fate, jointly subjected to the basic structures of global financialized capitalism, which can become the object of common concern and public scrutiny. They must conceive themselves, in other words, as potential members of a public, if not of a demos, for whom the structures to which they are subject are matters of vital interest. Second, in addition, a productive legitimation crisis presupposes subjects who interpret the crisis dynamics they experience as manifestations of system failures, not as fatalities that cannot be changed, nor as simple bad luck. They must reject, in other words, the neoliberal mantra of Tina, 
believing instead that another world is possible and that it is worth engaging in collective action in order to build it. Third, then two, a true legitimation crisis presupposes subjects who conceive history as an open process, subject to political intervention, aimed at solving collective problems in the public interest. They must feel a sense of shared responsibility for the political work of making right the wrongs and failures of the current system by constructing a new world order. They must invest their hopes, in other words, not in private satisfactions, but in public action and ultimately in democratically accountable public power. Additionally, legitimation crisis presupposes subjects who believe in their hearts that they have the right to govern themselves and to determine collectively along with others what sort of world they want to inhabit. Throwing off the mindset of subalternity, I'm teaching Gramsci, so all of this resonates with me, they must have the courage and the will to insist that their social arrangements be subject to democratic scrutiny and that those arrangements be changed if and when they fail to withstand such scrutiny. Finally, legitimation crisis presupposes subjects whose commitment to change is not exhausted by the general proposition that another world is possible in principle. Beyond, beyond that abstract mantra, they must envision at least the bare outlines of actual concrete alternatives simultaneously desirable and feasible. Now, not all of these motivational preconditions hold today in full form. In fact, neoliberal thinking has assaulted every one of them at every point. But the seeds of some of them are present in latent form. This is the case I would submit for numbers two and three at the very least. I have to remember what two and three was. Yes, the, the seeing uh, things as system failures, not fatalities, and history as an open project subject to intervention. I think that these are probably um, in some latent way available to us and that they could in principle be reactivated, made to bloom through processes that contest the neoliberal common sense that has eroded them. Others, such as one and four, would require uh, something more. One is this um, idea of seeing yourself as a potential member of a shared community of fate jointly, subject to the same basic structure, which could be an object of contestation. And four is believing, really, in a deep way, in the right to govern oneself and to make the world as one sees fit. Um, these, I say, would require more to, to get really uh, going. Perhaps the empowering experience of struggle and of solidarity in struggle. The last, the, the sort of not just the general mantra, another world is possible, but some concrete sense of what it might look like, at least in its barest outline. This is the hardest one for me at least, to imagine. In, what I mean is the one whose emergence is the most difficult to visualize, although I wouldn't rule out that it might too materialize as a practical force at some point in the days ahead. Whether and when that might happen, we cannot now know, but this much at least um, is clear to me. Only such psychosocial experiences and political cultural attitudes can turn our administrative crisis into a true legitimation crisis. And only a legitimation crisis of that sort can lead to the sort of deep structural transformation of the financialized capitalist order that is needed to resolve in an emancipatory way all the strands of the multi-dimensional crisis we currently face, ecological, social, economic, as well as political. I mean, what I'm saying here is that without some major reconstitution of democratic public power, we have no hope of solving any of these other uh, strands. I have a very um, pathetic short conclusion. Mm -hmm. I sort of ran out of gas in writing this. I hope to have shown, at least, the value and possibility of a crisis critique of capitalism that overcomes the limitations of orthodox models. I hope to have shown the value of positing uh, 
an expanded conception of capitalism as the object of such a critique, and I hope to have shown the plausibility of interpreting the current crisis of democracy as an expression of the political contradictions of capitalism, or that is, as the political dimension of a broader multifaceted crisis, which also has other important dimensions. Um, yeah. Finally, I would be especially pleased if I have convinced you, however indirectly, that whoever speaks about democracy today must also speak about capitalism. Thank you.